so I've got the QR code to um, a little quiz that I built two days ago actually up there. You can scan that and do it, or it's also, we're gonna come back to it later, so do it in your, in your own time, but yeah. I was like, yesterday I was worrying about, should I do it with, like, this is gonna take too long, so I thought, okay, I'll just have the QR code up there. Um, so I don't know if anyone had a chance to scan it. If you wanted to scan it, else it will pop up again later today as well. Um, so uh, thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to present today. My name is Ilinka Barsan. I'm a director of data science at Wonderman Thompson, which is a creative agency. Um, and I've got quite a kind of, I'm, I feel very privileged to be in the role that I am. So I'm one of the founding members of our global creative data group, which is a little um, interdisciplinary group of we've got, so we've got a data science department and I say department, it's me and then it's one other data scientist. And then we've got developers, um, one developer, then we've got creative technologists, so we've got design and um, copywriting covered. Um, and we work together to build creative data, um, I guess, prototypes and products. So a lot of prototyping and then um, the occasional kind of product once we get, once we get to the stage of actually building it. Um, and it's a very, it's a kind of privileged position because we work like the data science, we work at the intersection of those different disciplines. So I kind of have to collaborate with creatives, um, kind of traditional creatives on a day-to-day -day basis and kind of learn how they, kind of things like user experience and user flow is so important, but might not be that important to you if you're just working on the backend coding. So it's kind of been a really in interesting experience. Um, so that's my team, and then I also wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. So you can see a little picture of me on my first birthday. Um, I'm Romanian, I was born in Romania, and in Romania it's, um, it's a tradition that you, at your first um, birthday, you kind of get presented with a plate, and your parents will have placed like different objects on that plate. And in theory, like whatever you pick from that plate is supposed to kind of be your destiny, your professional destiny. Um, so I actually ended up picking a coloring pencil and a calculator, which didn't make much sense at all. I think my parents were just hoping for the calculator rather than the coloring pencil. Um, but it kind of, it's been kind of interesting looking back, back at this and thinking, oh, maybe there is like a little bit of truth to that. Um, so I always wanted to be a writer. I think part of me still wants to be a writer. Um, I was always kind of growing up, I was kind of the creative kid. I was always scribbling, um, I was painting, I was drawing. Um, kind of not very drawn to kind of math and all of those kind of things. Um, that was more something that I felt like I maybe just wasn't very good at, um, so I enjoyed the creative side more. Um, I then studied sociology and politics because I thought, okay, I want to be a creative, but maybe aiming to be a novelist or a writer in that sense isn't a very realistic choice. So I thought, okay, maybe I can be a journalist and kind of get that um, subject knowledge background. Um, so, and then after that, I kind of realized, okay, I'm really interested in the internet, kind of obsessed with the internet, and I realized, okay, this is actually something I could also study um, in kind of from a, sociolo from a sociological point of view. So I did um, my undergrad thesis was actually about how older adults in sheltered housing were using the internet and kind of learning to use computers for the first time, and I realized, oh, that's like fascinating, and you can actually make this um, your academic career or kind of your next step. Um, so then I did a master's in social data science, so um, a master's in social science of the internet, and I realized, oh, I could kind of go, so I, I had done e interviews previously, and I thought, okay, I could kind of go down the career path of keep doing qualitative research, um, or I could just get a little bit out of my comfort zone and kind of try to learn all the programming that they were offering. Um, so that's kind of the route um, I went down, and I kind of fell in love with programming because I realized once you add programming and a programming language to your creative toolkit, there's just so many amazing things you could do. And it gave me like the same satisfaction that I had previously gotten from just kind of like writing something and then editing it and then being happy with it. Um, so then I started working for WPP, which is the parent company of the agency that I work at now, and I was able to kind of experiment with a few different roles, and I slowly shifted from strategy into data science, um, and that's how I ended up in the role that I am <coughs> at now. Um, but this is something that I've kind of been grappling with for the past five years or so, like, did I abandon my creative pursuits? Because if you say, I'm a data scientist, people kind of think, okay, you're like a left brain thinking kind of person and then I, I, I kind of felt like maybe I was like betraying my younger self or something at times. I feel like it's been like an up and down. So um, the talk that I'm going to give today is really, I feel like as much a little therapy session for myself as it is like hopefully going to be useful for you guys to kind of think about and frame it a little bit. 
Um, yeah, so I want to make the argument that data science is inherently creative. And I think that's, it's kind of, there's a lot of interesting um, discussions going on right now with tools like DALI2, like creating incredibly realistic images. Um, GPT-3 can do like some beautiful poetry. So there's all this talk about our machines about to replace creatives. And I think that is kind of an interesting, I've got like my own points of view design that I love to talk about as well, but it's kind of, that's not the point of my talk here. I want to make an argument for the fact that as data scientists, we are engaging in like inherently creative work, like no matter where you are in the data science workflow. Okay, um, so this is, that, that was my intro. The second part, I'm going to move on to the test yourself. If you've got, I'm going to have the QR code up again in a second if anyone didn't get a chance to do it. So kind of finding out what's your creative data type and to build that, I mean, it's not a very scientific framework, I'm going to be honest, but I kind of took like those traditional classifications of data scientists. And I loved like if you were at the New York Times uh, talk, you kind of saw the Venn diagram with like subject knowledge, um, coding expertise, and then I think the statistics. And I was kind of thinking about that and thinking about how this might apply to different types of people in kind of thinking about creative data science. Um, and then uh, I'm moving on to the actual topic of the talk, which is data science as a creative discipline. And I've split it in two parts. So I'm going to talk about the approach and the process as creative first, and then about the output and how we communicate that output as also kind of a creative discipline. And then some questions at the end. Okay, so this is, if you didn't get a chance to do this before, um, you can also, if you're on your laptop, you can just type it in. It's um, elinkavalentina at .pythonanywhere.com. This is also really going to test my deployment skills for like that flask up because I have no idea um, how many people can do it at the same time. If everyone has it, um, I'm also going to go. So I wanted to, it should bring you to a little website. I was also two days ago, I was kind of Googling how to make like an HTML template look really nice, which I feel like has given me new respect for like our design team and development team. Okay, so I just wanted to very quickly um, talk you through my answers to the quiz. So the first one is what compliment would you be most excited to receive? And I've chosen that I'd be most excited to receive a compliment that you're so resourceful. I can't believe you taught yourself all of this over the weekend. That would take other people months. I feel like that would make me really happy. And um, then which task would you rather fast forward? Um, I would probably rather fast forward like the endless optimization process um, because I'm a perfectionist in some things, but then really not in others. So I kind of get a little impatient. And if it's working, we should just move on, in my opinion. But um, that can be a little controversial. So um, what's the first thing you do on a new data project? I kind of like to sketch out like what kind of my hopes for the project and where I could, um, where I could really go. And then I kind of figure out like, who to get involved to actually make it happen. And then um, what makes a data set particularly juicy to you? I think it's anything with like an emotive hook and if you can weave together different data sets in an unexpected way to tell a story, that gets me very excited. Um, and then I'm not gonna read these pickup lines to you because I'm slightly embarrassed, but you can read them in your own time. Um, and then my response was um, the tinkerer as um, I had two responses for the tinkerer. And then the storyteller, one response, and then the visionary, which is kind of a pretentious name, but whatever, um, one response. So um, talking about, so these are the five types that you might have gotten. And obviously these are not, one doesn't exclude the other. I think a lot of data scientists will have like qualities from each of those probably. Um, just to go through them really quickly, the storyteller is really excited um, about communicating and distilling complex topics into very simple language and like very beautiful visuals. And the storyteller is usually quite popular because they're the one to volunteer to do like any kind of talks and presentations. So if they have people on their team who'd rather not do that, um, that's, I feel like they're quite popular for that. Um, then the tinker, which was like my number one response. Um, the tinker likes to experiment with code and also with ideas and kind of diving right into the programming process, knowing that the first iteration is probably not going to work and they're going to have to restart the whole thing again. Um, they get prototypes up and running fairly quickly. And if you're anything like myself, you might also have like a Raspberry Pi collecting dust at home where you had all these great project ideas, but never actually followed through. So that can be a struggle. Um, then the artisan, I think is great because they do things really efficiently and beautifully. Um, it's really about focus, depth and quality. And they're really good at kind of the deep and focused work. And that could be anything. It could be like building a data engineering pipeline perfectly or like really doing like interactive visualization for the web, web really beautifully. But it's all about kind of the depth of work. Then the inventor is kind of the um, 
I guess, the scientist um, of all of the types. So they like to really dig into the science and the math. Um, they like to kind of come up with novel solutions to very complex problems. Um, they're a secret academic, and if they don't have a login to academic journals, then they probably ask like anyone they know if they have a login or can send them a PDF of this and that paper. Uh, so I think they're obviously amazing. Um, and then the visionary is all about the bigger picture and the business impact. They use their intuition and their ability ins to inspire to really kind of bring people together. And often they will be in kind of like team leadership roles. Um, I would say like the guy who leads our team is definitely a little bit of a visionary. Um, and then I wanted to actually use this framework to kind of move um, to kind of move through the presentation and not just kind of give you this quiz. Um, so you'll see like the exclamation marks and you'll also see the hearts um, throughout the presentation. And this is kind of opportunities and also where different types might do things really well already. So in, in this example, for example, um, this area might be an opportunity for um, the artisan and the inventor to kind of like maybe expand or go a little bit out of their comfort zone. And then in this case, um, the visionary, the tinkerer, and the storyteller might already like, be pretty comfortable with that topic. Okay, so then moving on to approach and process. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is this concept of remix and borrow. Um, there's all these ideas like steal like an artist and no idea is actually original because everything has been done before. Um, and I think as data scientists, we're actually in a great position with this because we do a lot of remixing just by the nature of our job. We very rarely will like write an entire project from scratch and I feel like we're very comfortable like finding solutions, um, taking like code snippets and solutions and then obviously like always giving credit. But it's, it's kind of a process that we are really, um, really familiar with the remixing um, and the borrowing aspect. Um, but I think this can also be kind of taking from different disciplines. So in advertising, like if you think about advertising analytics, it kind of is almost like a menu of things you can do. Like you can do some A-B testing, you can do some segmentation, but actually like going into other disciplines and figuring out like where does my background come in? Where can I borrow from other disciplines? So I'm a big fan of network science um, from that kind of the social network analytics. And I've really enjoyed like taking that into a field where it's maybe not so often used and kind of applying it in unexpected ways. Um, I think the tinker, the visionary and the storyteller are probably really good at this already. Maybe an opportunity for growth for the artisan and the inventor but I don't really think so in the data science context because I think we probably do this all the time, but it's kind of nice to just, um, yeah, just make yourself aware of some of the practices that you might not really think of as creative, but are actually very unusual in other disciplines. Um, then collaboration. Um, collaboration is really interesting and you might be lucky and be, be kind of in an organization and a team where you are forced to do that every day anyways. I'm kind of forced to do that if my code or if my model takes two minutes to execute our like designer and UX designer is gonna to come to me and say, we need to like figure out a way to turn this into 30 seconds. So that collaboration can really um, kind of help, I guess, take the work to the next level. But there's also many organizations where data science is gonna be very insular and you might collaborate with technology or those kind of teams, but you don't necessarily um, collaborate with more unexpected um, colleagues like creatives. So I think that's a, it's, it's kind of a very valuable Thing to do to get their perspective um, and there's an interesting bit of research on kind of the out the the effect of collaboration on creative performance the original um, paper was actually built on broadway musicals and they were kind of looking at the small network of people involved in making broadway musicals and they found that if they looked at artistic performance and creative performance so kind of financial performance and reviews and then also how many people were involved in making something um, there's a, up to a certain threshold, more collaboration is gonna like push your kind of product and your creative output to the next level. But once you cross a certain threshold, it's kind of like the too many cooks concept. It like actually diminishes it. I think that's just kind of a fascinating piece of research from kind of an unexpected discipline. Um, but yeah, I'm sure, it, I feel like that's very relatable, just thinking about the amount of, as soon as you've got too many people involved, sometimes it's like really hard to actually get work done and it's kind of been a conversation in my team as we think about how can we expand because right now we're only six people how can we expand without kind of losing the um, I guess the positive aspect of collaboration um, I think the visionary and the storyteller are probably pretty good at this already I think maybe it's 
an opportunity for, depending on how, where you're working, for the inventor, the tinker, and the artisan um, to kind of think about um, how you can collaborate with maybe unexpected colleagues. Um, then this idea of constraints, and that constraints are actually very <coughs> creative. So um, this idea of kind of paralysis of choice, and there's been research done on when people are presented with kind of, um, they can do anything, or they have like a certain set of constraints, they actually come up with um, more varied and more ideas if they have that set of constraints. Um, and I think that's kind of interesting to think about. So in my team, I'm always kind of constrained just by the fact that we have to build a user-friendly creative output at the end of something. So whatever I'm doing kind of has to work in that limit. And sometimes that means I can't use like the most computationally intensive models and I just have to find kind of simpler ways to do it. this, but kind of seeing the creativity in that. Um, and there was actually one interesting project we worked on earlier this year about where I was really aware of this. So we had to build um, a model of epidemiology, an epidemic model to model spread of a disease, um, not COVID, thank goodness. Um, but it became, because it was for a pharma client, it became very obvious that we'd have to base this on peer-reviewed research. And because of a few different constraints, we actually ended up realizing, okay, the only paper we can use is this paper from 20 years ago that was written in Microsoft Excel, definitely no code base available or anything like that. So. It was kind of interesting um, realizing that working within those constraints and just kind of breaking down the problem and like ordering a book on Markov chains from 1997 is actually kind of like creative and fun. And I feel like it was um, very satisfying at the end to realize, oh, we were able to reproduce those results, just kind of pulling in from all different areas. Um, yeah, as data scientists, I feel like time, the tools we can use and money, we're like faced with those constraints always. Um, I think the, um, the inventor, the, the artisan, and the storyteller are probably already pretty good at those constraints. I think the tinkerer can be like overwhelmed by all the things they, could, they might be able to teach themselves. And I think the visionary also have to be like reeled in sometimes a little bit because they get, get excited about all the different possibilities. Um, so focus, I think, is actually really good for creativity. And I mean, everyone will have those constraints, but if you have them, if you don't have them, just artificially um, Creating them, I think, is super valuable. Okay, so this first part was all about um, the tools we're using, so and how I think the t like the actual process and the approach we take to data science has the possibility to be very creative. And I didn't really talk about data collection here, but I think the way we collect our data, because it's often, it's I mean, most of the time, it's not as easy as just downloading a CSV that we can use. Um, that's like that's uh, a very that can be a very creative like creative process too. Okay, so next thing, I'm going to move on to how the output and how we communicate that output is actually um, has like great creative potential as well. So I'm going to talk about output first. Um, so the output, so I, I mentioned like DALI and um, GPT-3 in the beginning. I mean, there are so many models like that now, and I think it's important to kind of just mention those as something where the approach might be creative, um, but also the output is like in and of itself a creative output. So this was just a little project I did a few years ago where I took um, a, a book of, not a, not a book, a data set of poetry written by kids and I trained a neural network on it to generate kind of new poetries based, on, new, new poems based on that data. And this was one of the results I got. I am a giraffe that bounces in a tree. I score very basketball. I bounce on the field. And I thought that was kind of a very um, sweet little poem written by an AI and sometimes it was difficult like looking at the AI generated um, poems even though it wasn't a huge data set and the ones like written by kids they had a lot of um, obviously because it was trained on that data but it was interesting it was hard sometimes to tell those um, apart um, and then I'm also almost like embarrassed to show you the following few slides because I feel like image generation has changed so much just in the past year or so um, this was something we built in 2021, which was um, actually for one of our offices. They wanted an art, like an AI-driven art installation. So we built, um, they kind of have like a big screen, and we built this generator where people can type in, show me, a, show me bunnies fighting in space, and then it projects on the wall um, in the lobby, which is super fun. Um, so this was bunnies fighting in space. This is AI on the tennis court. And then the graffiti of Garfield. 
Um, but it's just amazing thinking if I use DALI 2 now to give me a graffiti of Garfield, it would not look like this. Like here you can really tell that AI still did it, which I kind of like that stage, I'm not sure. Um, the current stage, how I feel about it yet, but yeah, we'll see. Um, and then I wanted to give you an example of an actual product that we built as well, because those were kind of more like fun, like side projects, almost like internal tools we were building. Um, this was something that we built for Sherwin-Williams. It's called Speaking in Color. And the idea was that color is such a personal thing to everyone. And if I talk about fall foliage in Vermont, I'm probably thinking of a very different color that you might be thinking of. And the challenge was kind of how can we take language and then transform it into a color that architects and also just general users might be able to go into a store and purchase. Um, so because, yeah, everyone is going to think of a very different um, a very different type of like fall foliage. Um, and the swatches kind of resulting from that are gonna be very different too. So um, these are three examples of like perfectly accurate fall foliage colors depending on what, what time you're thinking of. So the tool was kind of using, um, was using kind of voice detection and then natural language processing to translate um, into color kind of that first search. And then what was interesting was we would also allow people to adjust it afterwards. So you could say something like, make it more sad, make it more 1970s, and then you could kind of tweak it until you're happy with the result. Uh, so that was a super satisfying and fun project to work on. Um, and then the power of prototyping. Um, this is one of my quotes that I go back to um, over and over again. And it's, so the quote is, if it breaks, that means it's real. And the background for this is, we were, going to go to a client meeting and we had built this prototype that was really like stapled together because it was quite a hard thing to build and it was probably not ready yet to be shared with the clients. So before the presentation, we warned him that it might break and it did break, which was very stressful. But he actually said, I like, I like the possibility of it breaking because if it can break, that means it's real and you didn't kind of fake the prototype. So I think there's a lot of value in actually showing people like a little glimpse behind the curtain of what we built. Um, and I don't think these needs to look, this needs to be like a perfect project. I think just a collab notebook you can share with someone and you can like annotate a little bit and then walk someone through like part of your modeling or part of your data pipeline. I found that even people who don't have a data background actually really, um, really appreciate the glimpse behind the curtain. And it also forces you to, to kind of um, communicate your project in in that kind of way and kind of figuring out like which part of this can I actually make interactive and share rather than just having slides. Um, yeah, I think the tinkerer and the visionary are pretty good at that already um, and maybe an opportunity for growth um, if you're more of an artisan, an inventor or a storyteller. Okay, and then um, another point about talking to the non-nerds. Um, uh, because we love them and we really need them because often creativity happens where we can package our insights in a way that they can use it and kind of build on that. Um, and I think that's always a really interesting challenge if you need to, and I mean, that's also kind of related to the prototyping, but if you need to package a concept in a way that someone who has no idea about data science can understand, I think there's a lot of potential for creativity. Um, storyteller and visionary, I think, are pretty good at that and maybe the ones who are more like heads down coding um, are sometimes struggling with that. Um, but I wanted to show you this example that I used. So we were actually doing, we do a lot of work with computer vision and we want people to understand like what are the opportunities with computer vision, but maybe also what are like the potential pitfalls. Um, so I used the popular food or animal meme and I used the Google Vision AI to, um, Google Vision API to run the following images through it. So this first one is Chihuahua or Blueberry Muffin. And I was curious because I struggle with these sometimes, like is AI gonna be good at recognizing that? Um, and we actually, I think pretty good. I think there's on, let's see. Okay, yeah, there's one muffin in like the lower row that's been defined as an animal, but generally pretty good. I mean, the, the one like bottom left corner just looks like a muffin to me. Um, then golden doodle or fried chicken. <laughs> I think these might, might be like the most difficult ones potentially. Um, and AI definitely had some trouble with that, often misclassifying the golden doodle. No, the other way around, the fried chicken as a golden doodle. Um, and then the last one, sloth or chocolate croissant. Um, and actually surprisingly good though, I think bottom right, you can see that there's a chocolate croissant 
um, classified as an animal. So that was kind of a fun way to walk through the, an example that we wouldn't use to build anything, but just kind of show like things like the importance of the data set, set that something is training on, like being able to spot those mistakes, um, and just also the opportunities, because I mean, it's some of these are hard, so it's pretty cool that we're at a point where without, this was just the out of the box Google Vision API, we hadn't trained it on those. Um, I'm sure if you actually like trained on top of that, you could get some really good examples, uh, uh, some really good results. Okay, and then the final bit is when it comes to communication, I think like getting a little bit personal or like showing people a little bit of like yourself and your personality in a talk is a really good and valuable thing to do because sometimes we have these impressive models um, and especially if, I mean, I feel like data scientists are going to be very excited about them, but especially if your audience is broader than that, just kind of, um, yeah, making it a little bit personal. So I love to watercolor, so I watercolor all my slides, and I'm excited that now people can see my slides, at least like within the company, and say, oh, that's, those are Elinka slides. So whatever that thing is for you, I think that's like a really, a good exercise just to kind of become like aware of that and then um, use it, yeah. So I think to just to sum up, I think now I'm pretty confident saying that no, I did not kind of um, abandon my childhood creative pursuits. I think data science is a field with like a, a lot of potential for creativity. Um, and I'm very excited to be a data scientist. Um, yeah, so at the end just, um, yeah, we've got all of these again. And if you have any questions, and I also love if you manage to do the quiz, just to like get a show of hands for the different types. How many people got the inventor? Okay, we've got one there. Then the visionary. Two there. The storyteller. Oh, a lot of storytellers, that's awesome. Um, the tinkerer, that's me too. And then the artisan. Awesome, that's so interesting. I feel like we've got a, we've got a great mix here. But yeah, that's everything for me. And please, like, yeah, if you have any other questions, um, get in touch. And also we have time for questions now, I think, because I did okay on time. Oh yeah, um, so the um, so it worked. I have like I think I'm sure I have a sketch of it some somewhere. Um, but it started with you get you get on the site, you speak like, show me the color, show me the color purple or something. Or like you would probably wouldn't say that, but you would say show me the color of fall foliage in Vermont. Um, then the first step that was actually purely front end, where we actually um, our developer was pulling in a search. API that was then kind of analyzing the proportion of color in that image and then you get you get served kind of um, a palette of potential images and then you make like as a user you make your first choice and then that's kind of feeds into where the back end came in so after that first choice you have the ability to adjust and there are some adjustments that are super easy like um, make it brighter or make it darker that's an obvious adjustment um, but some adjustments that are maybe a little more subtle like make it sadder um, and we also had a few Easter eggs like there, like if you wanted to make it more prints, it would know that prints and purple are kind of like often thought of together, so we would make it more purple. Um, but the actual adjustment would work. We did in, we used both RGB models and the HSL model of color, and we did some language processing to kind of understand similarity of words and how like, if, if we're saying sad, is that actually which word that we know is that the closest to? And then we kind of made those adjustments and then you got to the final color. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was fun. The initial search engine step, Oh, sorry? The initial like, search engine step you said, uh, like, was it the and then it was the back, the and that was our team as well, but it was um, the developer. And we kind of have a split where we kind of at the beginning we figure out what is really easy for the front end to pull in where we don't need to pull in custom APIs and then like if, if there's something that we kind of need our custom, custom algorithm for then we will come in and we like build our APIs in Flask and then host on Google App Engine or like sometimes we use like other products like Core Weave. I don't know if anyone has used that if it's like more computationally intensive. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, one second. Let's go back. There you go. Um, I have a question. If you're a director 
how do you try to gauge the creativity in the system? So actually, um, I'm hoping that at some point we'll get to the point where we'll have external hiring. Right now, we were in a point where we were able to kind of transition people out of more traditional advertising analytics roles from the agency if they've kind of shown interest or if they kind of, yeah, if they're, if they're interested in getting involved with us. So that's how we've done our hiring of like our one data scientist who's awesome so far. Um, so it's going to be really interesting because if you have data scientists on paper, you kind of, I mean, I, I do think that every data scientist is, is creative, but you also have to enjoy this very particular process that we do. So yeah, it's kind of a challenge for the future that I'm kind of, yeah, excited for. I don't really have a question, but just wanted to say, Felicitations. Muito mais que a fellow Thank Romanian. <laughs> So that's a great question. So I, that's kind of fun where we sit in the team because in advertising often you will have teams attached to different clients and then they only work on that client. But we kind of get pulled into projects and we also do a lot of pitches. So we, um, Sherwin Williams as kind of like a color or paint manufacturer. Um, then we've definitely done some work with pharma though you are very, if you're a tinkerer, that can be a struggle because you're very kind of restricted in what you can do there for like excellent reasons. Um, and then also clients, just like um, any um, like beverage clients, or um, let me think what we're working on right now, like food. It can really be like across the spectrum, which is very fun. Any journalism work? No, I wish. <laughs> I feel like um, sometimes we we kind of try to internal things that we work on. Um, I think I want to kind of start a practice where we kind of write those up and then see if we can actually publish things, but that's kind of second to the actual, the day-to-day -day work. Um, but yeah, no journalism. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, <laughs> and thanks for participating.